Well, hello, I'm Pastor Austin Almaguer. I wanna welcome you to this week's online worship experience. Right now, Vienna Baptist is one church in many locations. And so no matter where you are today, uh, we're excited that you've joined us for worship. Our ministry theme this year is Braving the Wilderness, being church in uncharted territory. Wilderness is a theme that runs throughout the Bible. It is symbolic of seasons of challenge and transformation. And that's certainly how we are thinking about this season in the life of our church, in the life of the world. And we are seeking to capture a pioneering spirit as we brave this wilderness together to discover new and thriving ministry on the other side. Our church leadership has been hard at work uh, embracing this time with courage, creativity, and resilience, thinking about ways that we can be adaptive to the challenges that we face. And I am so proud of their hard work, and we're looking forward uh, to our first virtual church business meeting on Monday, June 29th at 7 p.m. And so if you're a church member, I hope that you make plans to attend. Uh, all of our members, uh, you should have received over the weekend an email that listed out some of the proposals that our church council is laying out, ways that we can be adaptive in our leadership structure, in the ways in which we think about budgeting, even the ways we're thinking about our building and the future of ministry here. Uh, so if you uh, haven't uh, had the chance yet, I encourage you to look through those proposals. There's a lot of material there, a lot of good research uh, and work has been put in. If you're a church member and you didn't get that that email uh, and you'd like to, you can email us at joinus at viennabc.org uh, and uh, Cindy will make sure uh, that you, you get that information. Also earlier this week, uh, the church council sent out a message uh, just sharing their plan uh, to take a quarterly approach to building openings trying to give us the opportunity uh, to not continue to be reactive, to go month by month in this kind of wait and see situation. And we know that as Virginia begins to ease restrictions on businesses and restaurants and social gatherings, that's that it's important that we're clear. And we've done a lot of listening in the congregation. We have voices across the spectrum, uh, but we've also been trying to pay attention to the advice of public health experts and medical advice. And so for this time, uh, the church council has unanimously decided to continue our journey in our online only form of ministry uh, until the end of August. It provides us the opportunity uh, to wait and see, to not be on the cutting edge of, of openings, but to uh, allow uh, parts of our uh, uh, society to, to open, to make sure that there uh, are no negative impacts on public health, and also to prepare ourselves with a different kind of equipments, trainings for leaders, and things that we'll want to do so that when we begin to regather uh, in person, we can do so. Uh, now, as I said, this is a quarterly approach. You can expect to hear another announcement from the church council in mid-August as they look at the next quarter, September through November. Uh, and based upon the new guidance uh, that we have, what we're hearing from medical experts, what we're seeing around the world, we'll make the best determination of how we can continue uh, to be church. Uh, I know that this announcement is uh, received with, with measures of both sadness um, and, and maybe measures of release. Um, I am, uh, it is hard for, for me to be physically distant from all of you, uh, but I know that the, the health, the safety of our community has to come first and, uh, and we'll continue to find ways that we can meaningfully connect and ways we can be creative uh, over the summer as well. So we'll share more information uh, uh, with that. You can find more information on our website as well. If you're a guest with us today, obviously we're busy thinking about the ways in which we're being church, but there's also so many ways to be connected even during this time. Uh, whether that's small community groups that are continuing to meet so that you can get to know other people, you can grow in your faith through Bible study, or ways in which we are making a difference in our community. So if you're a guest with us today, we are especially glad that you're here. We, we want to be able to get you uh, connected. And so if you're interested in learning more about ways you can engage, I encourage you to go to our website at viennabc.org slash connect. And the first thing you'll see on that page is our digital connections card. And I encourage you, you can fill that out. It's got some boxes you can 
check about things that you're interested in learning more about in the church, then you can just click submit. And that way, one of our amazing Connections team members can follow up with you this week and get you started on your journey of deeper connection. You'll also see uh, on that Connections page a way to sign up for our weekly newsletter where you can get updates on new opportunities for spiritual formation and growth and ways that you can make a difference as well. Uh, we also have our uh, online prayer request card. As a community, we care deeply about encouraging and supporting one another, and we be believe that begins in praying. Uh, and every week, uh, our ministers, our deacon team leaders, uh, commit to praying for the needs and concerns of our community. And so if there's something going on in your life this week you'd like others to join with you in prayer about, you can fill that card out. You can even check the box if you'd like a deacon to personally follow up with you and pray with you over the phone. These are many ways in which we are being church. And we also take time every week to take a moment in these services uh, to celebrate the ways in which God has blessed us this week and to practice generosity so that we can be a blessing to others. And we give as a community of faith because we, be we love God. And we believe that God has called us to this amazing and exciting mission of changing lives and transforming our community with the love of God. And this week, uh, we especially celebrate our deacons and our diaconate ministry. You know, deacons at Vienna Baptist are uh, lay leaders who have felt a call to ministry, to provide pastoral care and spiritual leadership uh, to our members. Each deacon uh, is uh, paired off with uh, individual members or families that they check in with regularly, that they pray for, uh, that they help to connect to further opportunities for growth. Right now, our deacons are doing a listening campaign throughout our membership, just talking to people about how God is at work in their lives, or what's been meaningful, and then what are their needs? How can we as a church better care for them and support them? This work of deep listening, of relational ministry, of being the connective network of our community is so vitally important. And so I'm grateful, and I hope you join me in celebrating our deacons. You know, we are invited to invest ourselves through the resources that God has given us, our energy, our prayers, and our money, to join God in building a better world of justice, love, and mercy. And giving at Vienna Baptist is simple and easy. You can go online to our website at viennabc.org slash give, or you can even text to give. You can text VNBC to 73256. Uh, that information's on the screen, or, or you can even mail in a check. Of course, during this time as we celebrate generosity, uh, it's also good to remind you that we are in the midst of our online pledge campaign. Every year we take time to make commitments uh, to our budget, ways in which we will be intentional about our giving over the course of the next year. And so making a pledge is uh, simple and easy online. You can do it through our website. Uh, just go to viennabc.org slash pledge for more information. Thank you for your generosity and your support as we seek to be the church and live on mission together. Well, these are all the ways that we seek to learn, to give, to serve, to bear witness. But today we've set aside time in our weeks for worship. And so it's in the spirit of praise, of inspiration, of challenge. And I invite you, will you continue to worship with us as we go to God in prayer? Let us pray for the needs of the world together. After I say the words, hear us, O God, I invite you to respond with, your mercy is great. God calls us to offer up the world's concerns and petition for others. Let us therefore pray for the church, the world, and those in need, saying, Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Blessed are you, sovereign God. You do not abandon what you have created, but continue to make your grace known among us. We thank you for those you have chosen to speak your reconciling word in this age and we pray for the faith to receive it. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Blessed are you, caring God. You hear the cries of the poor, 
You see the tears in the eyes of all who mourn. You know the pain of those in anguish, and you come to the side of the lonely. Call your church to compassion and service. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Blessed are you, God of peace. You call us to make warfare cease and to place our trust in the one who bears us up. Raise up peacemakers among all peoples and confound those who seek to destroy that peace. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Blessed are you, God of justice. You desire that all be one. Erase prejudice and class divisions. Bring strength to those who are persecuted and heal those who believe that destruction is the path of righteousness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Blessed one, turn us to your ways. Make us bold. Increase our passion for what is good. Inspire us with the witness of those who have gone before us, especially those who led the struggle toward equality for all, whose faith shines through the ages. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Into your hands we place the welfare of all for whom we pray. We trust in your mercy. Through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hello, we're so glad you joined us for worship. While this is a special time for children, we hope that all ages will find it meaningful. 
Well, as you can see, I found a new spot for the children's message this week. It's my kitchen. I'm trying to follow a recipe. It's my mom's lasagna recipe, and it calls for a half a cup of water. What can I use to make sure that I only add half a cup of water? Not any more, not any less. You use a measuring cup. And so if you've used one before or you've seen someone else use it, you know that you look for the line that says half a cup and you fill the water to that line. And that way you can follow your recipe. You might be thinking, Pastor Jenny, what does this have to do with our Bible reading? Well, our Bible reading comes from the book of Matthew. Jesus is talking to his disciples, the people that follow Jesus and learn from Jesus. And he says, you have to put God and me, Jesus, and giving out God's love first. And Jesus says something strange. He says, you might have to give up something to do that. Usually we think about, don't give up, right? Don't give up. You can do it. You got this. But Jesus says you might have to give something up in order to put giving out God's love and putting God first. One of those things might be fear or being afraid. And I thought about my measuring cup. So if we were to give God's love freely and God's love was like the water in my cup, then God's love of would the water would be overflowing, right? It would be pouring out of my cup because we'd be giving it freely. But if we let fear or worry or different things get in the way, it's like we're measuring God's love. Like saying, I'm only going to give out half a cup of water or God's love today. And it might look like, hmm, if I love this person and they don't like it, maybe I shouldn't love them. Or even more likely, if I love that person, what will other people think of me? What will they say? If maybe they're saying that person's not cool or you shouldn't be friends with them. And again, we only give a little bit of love away or maybe none at all. When really Jesus is saying, no, give my love freely. Let it overflow. Let it pour out of you. Make God's love part of everything you do and love everyone. And so that's our challenge from Jesus this week. How do we put Jesus and God and giving out God's love first? And what do we have to give up? Fear, worry, maybe even something we like or value or think is important. What gets in the way of showing that love? And what do we have to give up in order to do that? In order to be Jesus' disciple. Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your love. We thank you for this time together. Help us to put you first in our lives. Help us to make giving out your love part of everything we do. Help us to give up the things that get in the way, whether fear, worry, or other things. Help us to put you first. And may we give out your love freely and not measure it out. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
A disciple is not above the teacher, nor a slave above the master. It is enough for the disciple to be like the teacher and the slave like the master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebul, how much more will they malign those of his household? So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered up that will not be uncovered, and nothing secret that will not become known. What I say to you in the dark, tell in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim from the housetops. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father. And even the hairs of your head are all counted. So do not be afraid. You are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone, therefore, who acknowledges me before others, I also will acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever denies me before others, I also will deny before my Father in heaven. Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Yeah, I don't think that anyone has ever told me that our reading for today is their favorite passage of Scripture. And I, I'd probably be a little concerned if they did, right? I mean, Jesus says, I've come not to bring peace, but a sword. That's, that's a little unsettling. I mean, you, as we read this passage, you may be wondering, where is this sermon headed? For, for me today, it's uh, all the more ominous as outside my window, the rain is pouring, there's a thunderstorm going on, and I, I'm just reminded maybe that there's a gift, though, to following a three-year cycle of scripture readings that, that force us to wrestle with challenging readings like this one, rather than every week kind of cherry-picking the readings that we like. Today, we are reflecting on some tough and challenging words from Jesus. And they are part of one of the five great discourses or lectures that Jesus delivers in the Gospel of Matthew. And scholars refer to Matthew 10 as the missionary discourse because Jesus' attention is focused on the work of his disciples and future generations of disciples to spread the gospel through their words and deeds. And Jesus promises that he will be present in the disciples' missionary work, and, and he empowers them to serve as his representatives to the ends of the earth. To be faithful to this bold mission. Jesus tells them that they must be fearless in their confession, as the road ahead will not be easy. The disciples will face opposition, persecution, and rejection. There is a, a cost to discipleship that all who follow the way of Jesus must understand. And the disciples, they, they must have wondered, like, like, why is Jesus telling us that we're going to get into so much trouble I mean, why would his message create potential conflicts with our, our family and our friends and our neighbors? Isn't he supposed to be the prince of peace? Many people then and now imagine Jesus as this perfectly calm and nice guy. <laughs> but if that was the case, shouldn't he have been able to stay out of trouble better, right? Like, why did he end up 
on a cross if he was such a pleasant person. Well, as one scholar writes, evidently there is peace, and then there's peace. And that the demands of the prince of true peace may very well feel like a sword cutting through the lesser loyalties of our lives and making quick work of our flabby common sense morality. So also reminded this week uh, of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s writing in his letter from Birmingham City Jail, uh, where he talks about his disappointment with the white moderate who is more devoted to order than to justice, who prefers a negative peace, which is the absence of tension, to a positive peace, which is the presence of justice. See, choosing to become a disciple of Jesus is choosing to live by a different set of values for your life. For Jesus, true discipleship is the art of seeking God's kingdom of justice, love, and mercy with a single-minded determination and letting the chips fall where they may. It is seeking and embracing a positive peace that requires us to get into right relationship, the Hebrew understanding of justice, being in right relationship with one another. Jesus tells us that the kingdom work, it turns out, is more controversial and subversive than conventional kindness. To be a disciple means that we must confront all that is not right within us, to repent and change our ways of living and to take action to build a world that reflects the values of Jesus. And this is a timely message for us today as we seek to be faithful to Jesus in a world filled with so much suffering, anger, and pain. It is a reminder to us, that, that seeking to live and love like Jesus, trying to build communities that reflects God's love, it's not always welcomed with joyous celebrations and, and ticker tape parades because it makes us and others uncomfortable. So Friday night, uh, I was honored by the personal invitation of my friend, Dr. Vernon Walton. He's the senior pastor of First Baptist Church of Vienna, the oldest worshiping community in Vienna, a historic African-American church formed in 1867. Now, I was invited to, to speak and to pray at their Juneteenth Rally of Remembrance. At Juneteenth, or Freedom Day, is the oldest celebration commemorating the ending of slavery in the United States. And for their gathering, it was a time that was uh, billed as a moment of, of prayer and of protest. And the speakers were a wide range of uh, local elected officials, pastors, and, and other leaders. And it was interesting I, uh, that we had uh, some of our, our white pastors who came up. I was moved and touched by many of their words. Many of them shared the ways in which that not just this moment, but the relationships that they had built over the past few years, the experiences they had had, had helped them to see in this moment clearly that they must confess how, how their hearts and minds had been malformed by racism and white supremacy. Uh, one pastor who grew up down in the Charlottesville area, he, he, he said that he, when I was growing up, I, had, I was given the wrong heroes to admire. He talked about the ways in which he had been given a false history, one that, that didn't honor and respect the histories, the struggles, and the contributions of his black brothers and sisters. He, he began with confession, with lament, with repentance, 
and even invited those to pray with him, but also for him. And I also noted that, that while these pastors modeled uh, a spirit of, of, of confession and repentance, that we also had some asks of our black brothers and sisters who were there, that, that, that all of us, no matter our race, class, or background, that, that all of us m must do the hard work of, of internal change, but that we must also join together in taking public action. You know, I have noted how many of my colleagues and, and how many uh, writers and, and, and thinkers, both in the church and outside it, have shared that in this moment, they are so happy to see a, a kind of growing consciousness and, and energy amongst white people to take action. But they've also been disillusioned over the past few years of the ways in, in which in moments of crises, whether it is the death of, of Eric Garner, Freddie Gray, whether it is the uh, Emanuel Nine, uh, that there is a, a rush from white churches to, to make Facebook posts, to, to form anti-racist book clubs, to, to, to talk about undoing their own internal uh, biases and stereotypes and prejudices, but then somehow it doesn't convert to public action, that, that they seem to get bogged down and stuck in internal work and, and never show up, speak out, and stand alongside people of color as they need to take action. And so the ask of the church, there, there was great respect and honoring uh, of the white pastors who made these confessions and made these uh, words of repentance. And the ask was then to act, which they all made, right? It's also why uh, when I spoke, I made the commitment that as Vienna Baptist Church, we would continue to stand alongside our sister church and the other churches that were also gathered there to take meaningful action, to, to work towards substantive policy change. And this has been something that has been at the core of our work for the past few years. As a church, we organized uh, our, with our immigrant neighbors in Vienna to, to restore bus service to the town so, so that people didn't have to walk four miles round trip to the grocery store. We, we, we won over a million dollars in reinvestment here. We've been working with our sister uh, communities of faith through Voice, a coalition of, uh, of almost 50 faith institutions to, to stop evictions in Virginia, evictions that are disproportionately impacting people of color will continue the, the work this week as I'll represent uh, the church and voice on a call with the governor as we are pushing to, to extend that uh, moratorium on evictions as it's set to expire on June 28th as we seek uh, to make meaningful uh, criminal justice reform. Uh, this is the ask of people of color right now, for all people of faith, is that we might take action, that we might follow Jesus in this way. And, and I want to be clear that, that all these things we are talking about, these are, these are not somehow add-ons to our faith, or, or somehow the, the, the church uh, in America is getting overly political. Look, we, we follow a Messiah who announced in his first sermon that the Spirit of the Lord was upon him and had anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to set the captives free, to liberate the oppressed. He, he told his disciples that they would be judged by how they helped the poor, the hungry, the vulnerable, the marginalized. The, the, the life of discipleship demands that we take action to build a more just world. We, we can't turn a blind eye to injustice and, and just walk away. I mean, discipleship is about taking real and concrete steps to change our personal lives and to change the world around us. And for the first church, and, and for so many churches around the world. Being faithful followers of Jesus means enduring literal and physical persecution. 
There are Christian communities around the world that continue to endure imprisonment and violence for their bold confessions of faith in the risen Messiah and for their work to seek to join God in building a world where all people are loved, valued, and respected. And while we live in a country of religious liberty, I think that this moment that we are living in in history it reminds us of what the Christian life essentially is. It's a confession of God's act in Jesus. It is living towards the redemption of all things with a concern for mission in this world. It is letting go of both material possessions and fear of what others might think of us or do to us and placing our loyalty in the God revealed in Christ and putting that above all other loyalties, even the deepest ones of home and family. To live a life of non-violence, even as we take direct action against injustice, to trust in God and in God's future. And we've talked recently about what it looks like for us as individuals in this moment, right? It, it means listening to and learning from those who are experiencing injustice and oppression. It means speaking out against bigotry and injustice, showing up in the work for justice, supporting organizations committing to dismantling racism. We also have a responsibility as a community of faith to take collective action, to be people whose words and deeds demonstrate that a new and better world is possible. And so for you today, I want to keep continuing to, to encourage you on this journey, right? Wherever you are. Maybe part of the uncomfortability of following Jesus in this moment is first beginning with some introspection. Seeing the ways in which you have been malformed by racism, by, by unconscious biases, by, by privilege. I am well aware as a person that despite my heritage as Mexican-American, my, my light skin has in my life afforded me privileges denied to previous generations of Almaguer's, denied to my friends. I, I've watched it happen before where people have treated us differently or people have treated me differently based upon where they think my family comes from, what they think my racial background is. Now, I have to continue to do my own work. Uh, understanding how that has impacted me, has shaped me, and, and how I might um, continue to overcome to grow and to mature as a person. What confessions do you need to offer? What, what places, what hardnesses, what, what things do you need to seek repentance for? And then also, how is God calling you to act in this moment? Now, I'm grateful uh, for those of you, uh, members of this, this church, who joined us at the Juneteenth gathering. Um, those of you who, who've been part of so much our, of our work in the community right now as a pastor, I'm grateful for your support in these moments where I represent the church, uh, seek to, to build partnerships, to stand in solidarity. That is uh, a great encouragement to me, and I, I don't take lightly um, the Anabaptist support of this work. And I hope that we will continue to build upon the foundation that we've built over the past few years, where we have been boldly taking action, where we've been seeking to be faithful. And I hope in this time, we're also thinking about ways in which we might be intentional, about rethinking the ways that we are church. How, how can we foster a greater diversity and racial equity as a church within us? What's the internal work we should do amongst ourselves and what is the ongoing external work that we seek to do? 
Uh, we'll continue uh, to keep you posted. Uh, First Baptist Church is, is working to lead on some initiatives uh, of racial equity and justice in our community, and we'll share with you ways that you can support that work. And we're going to continue this conversation of what it means to be faithful disciples of Jesus next week um, as we enter into part two of this missionary discourse. And so this week, I just encourage you to spend some time in prayer and reflection, examining your own heart, listening for the Spirit in ways in which you are called to live out your faith boldly, publicly. And may we know that we follow a prince of true peace, a positive peace, a Jesus who may make us uncomfortable at times, who may force us to confront hard truths, but always calls us to new and better life. A God who is seeking to make all things new, who invites us to sit down at the table of brotherhood and sisterhood as a shared humanity, who breaks down divisions of race, class, sex, and gender, of language, of culture, of any other barrier we can put up, who breaks those down so that we might be one family, that together we might sing of this God of justice and love that we might be renewed by the changing of our hearts and minds to be God's people, unified in mission, seeking boldly to go out into the world to make God's kingdom a reality. May we be those people today. Amen. Well, it's so good to worship with you today. Uh, if you're a guest with us, I'm especially glad that you're here. I hope you'll go to viennabc.org slash connect and fill out that connections card so we can greet you uh, personally. And I hope all of you, you know, one of our practices as a church is to continue to spread good news, to spread God's love in the world. And so if parts of this service have spoken to you, inspired you today, resonated. I hope that you'll share that with others, whether that's through posting a quote or emailing this service to someone else or inviting someone to virtually join with you at church next week. However you choose to do, let, let us be people who share the good news. And all the ways that we travel, though, uh, until we see each other again, may you receive now this parting blessing attributed to the uh, Franciscan order. Uh, may God bless you with a restless discomfort at half-truths, easy answers, and superficial relationships, so that you will seek truth boldly and live deeply from your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and the exploitation of people, so that you will tire tirelessly work for justice freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, and starvation, and the loss of all they cherish, so that you will reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with just enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this old world so that you are able, with God's grace, 
to do those things that others say cannot be done. Go in peace, my friends. Amen.